All right, so we want to see how to try to prove this principle that human happiness is the highest good. And what we've seen so far only is that we know how we cannot prove it. We cannot prove it by saying that the highest good conduces to some higher good, because of course there is no higher good when we're talking about the highest good. <clears throat> and so in his uh, difficulty to try to prove this utility principle, Mill, in fact, ends up saying something rather strange and provocative, something that's been, in fact, the source of some criticism of him ever since he wrote it. Um, I think, in fact, that his reason for saying this is tied pretty intimately with his rather extreme empiricism. Uh, that's the sort of view he has about the nature of knowledge. But it would really take us too far afield to, to get into that. So I think I'll just leave it as a sort of question um, a sort of mystery about why he why he ends up saying this, but here's what he says. He ends up comparing what's desirable to what's visible. Okay, and here's the idea. He says, "Well, just as the clearest test of something's being visible is that people in fact see it, so the clearest test that something is desirable, the clearest evidence that something is desirable, is that in fact people do desire." Now, what's the point of that? Well, what's the thing that's most desirable? What's the thing that everybody seems to desire? Happiness, of course. Okay? And so the fact that people do desire happiness, and it does seem to be perhaps most of all the thing that everyone desires, uh, Aristotle, in fact, observed this point a long, long time ago. Okay? Um, if there's one thing that everybody wants, it's probably happiness. Right? Um, and so Mill is saying the fact that people do desire it seems to be evidence of happiness's desirability, just as the fact that we all seem to see, say, uh, the color green means that that's awfully good evidence that green is in fact visible. Um, but this analogy has certain, certain difficulties and certain limitations. Most clearly, I think, is this. Uh, desirability isn't related to the notion of desiring in the way that visibility is related to the notion of seeing. Okay. Visibility seems to mean ability to be seen. Okay. Whereas desirability does not seem to mean ability to be desired, but something like worthiness of being desired. Okay. Um, the mere fact that something is desired doesn't seem to make it thereby desirable, um, in the same sort of way that when something is seen, that does seem to imply that it is in fact visible. Okay. Um, and so the fact that people desire something, contrary to what Mill says, does not really seem to be a very good test, uh, a very good evidence that, that the thing desired is in fact desirable. Okay. Um, after all, there's nothing impossible in supposing that lots of people desire something that is, in fact, not desirable. Okay? That we're all sort of confused about which things really are valuable in this world and so on. Okay, so that's sort of how the criticism goes. <clears throat> now, um, Mill uh, uh, does respond to some objections. He doesn't respond to that one, but he does, of course, like any good philosopher, entertain certain objections to his view, and I want to think about one in particular. Um, and this is probably the first criticism he, he considers, and it goes like this. Um, gee, Mill, human pleasure certainly seems to be a good thing, but it seems counterintuitive to say that it's the only good thing, or that it's the highest thing, or the best thing in the life of a human being. Because, after all, if we try to think about the, uh, the perfect human life, or the worthy human life, or the good life, well, it doesn't seem to be merely a life that's full of happiness. It seems to involve other things. Uh, and because human beings are so complex and have this kind of rich psychological uh, structure, it seems like there's more involved in the notion of a good life than merely human happiness. In fact, 
Happiness seems to be the highest good maybe for things like dogs or pigs, but not for human beings. Okay. So Mill says, is this not, talking about his own view now, okay, he's sort of taking up the side of his opponent and saying, is this doctrine not really a doctrine worthy only of swine? Okay. Meaning, well, isn't it really only pigs whose highest good is is happiness rather than human beings who have this kind of rich and complex emotional and psychological life. Now to this criticism Mill gives a very interesting and provocative answer and he says well look that objection will tempt you if you make the mistake of thinking that human pleasures are no different from the pleasures of the beasts. Okay. Now <clears throat> it's true says Mill that we have beastly pleasures we have the pleasures of food and sex and drink and so on. Dogs and pigs have those too. And it's also true that uh, just like animal pleasures, our pleasures can differ in quantity. We can have more or less uh, pleasure. And of course this might be uh, somewhat complicated. Perhaps if some chocolate is pleasurable then more is more pleasurable, but, uh, but there's going to be a limit on that, right? Uh, at some point you'll have so much chocolate that it's, that it's not pleasurable anymore and so on. But, but none of that impugns the pretty clear fact that we can take more or less pleasure in a thing. Some experiences are more pleasurable than others. But what Mill says is distinctive about human pleasure is that not only does it differ quantitatively, it also differs qualitatively. Okay? Human pleasures differ in quality just as much as they differ in quantity. <clears throat> and what Mill is thinking of here is pleasures that have to do with the intellect or with the emotions, um, as opposed to pleasures that have only to do with bodily things, sex and food and so on. Okay? And Mill's claim is that these higher pleasures, these intellectual pleasures, these emotional pleasures, are indeed higher. That is, more valuable than the lower pleasures, the bodily pleasures. In fact, they are so much more valuable than the lower pleasures that any amount of the higher pleasure is more valuable than any amount of the lower pleasures. Okay. So the pleasure one gets from proving a difficult mathematical theorem, for example, or, I don't know, from hearing a, a great piece of music or whatever, is somehow higher in quality than the pleasures associated with sex and food and so on. Okay. And so that's the way around the objection, right? You say, well, I know it might seem like a doctrine worthy only of swine to say that the highest good for human beings, the highest thing of which we're capable, right, is merely pleasure. But Mill says, but our pleasure isn't like the pleasure that the beasts have. Our pleasure is rich and complicated and interesting. All right, well, I think that's probably uh, enough for now. Um, that's Mill's view, utilitarianism, right? Pleasure is the highest good, absence of pain. And he's a consequentialist, meaning that uh, the fact that we've laid out these goods means that we know how to act. We act so as to maximize those things. And remember, of course, that it's everyone's pleasure that counts. It's not just mine or yours. Right? So utilitarianism is a very sort of egalitarian view. Everyone's happiness counts equally. And we get this kind of famous slogan, each is to count for one and none for more than one. Right? So of course your own happiness matters, but it doesn't matter any more than anybody else's. So when you're in the sort of deliberative mode, trying to decide what to do, you take into account the happiness of all people who would be affected by your possible actions. Okay, that's utilitarianism. That's enough for now.